winged specter of war hovers over Shanghai. Japanese planes strike the first blow and it's a terrible one. Loaded with death, they swoop over the unprotected roofs of Chapei and there's the first bomb. The frightened people of this densely packed district can hardly believe that such an awful thing is happening. But plane after plane brings new destruction. Soon flames begin to leap from scores of roofs. Chapei, only a few minutes ago, the peaceful home of many thousands is now the seat of war and terror. Fear-stricken people soon fill the streets. Wretched and wailing, they flee from that hail of sudden death. Old and young, sick and well, women, children, homeless now and driven to seek safety anyhow and anywhere. Some make pitiful efforts to save a few possessions, while more planes rain bombs on the native district. Whatever the military objects of the Japanese, it is still true that under these roofs are thousands of women and children, old people and peaceful civilians. Why should such as these be forced to pay such a ghastly price when nations disagree? They all throng to the international settlement, for there no bombs will fall, as it is under the rule and protection of the British, French, Americans and Italians. The settlement is already the crowded home of more than a million people. But there is nowhere else to go. Driven literally by the fear of death, refugees from tragic Chapay flock in thousands to the settlement until the road is blocked with a mass so thick it can hardly move. The municipal council declares a state of emergency exists. A mild, official way of putting it. For what is happening at Shanghai alarms and disturbs the whole world. Meanwhile, in the settlement, the Ronins, who are organized Japanese civilians, are busily making sandbags to help their land forces turn the district of Hongkyu into a military base. So far, Japan has landed only sailors and marines, who are soon to taste the quality of China's sturdy defense. As the Japanese marines set out to establish their barricades, we accept the escort of a British Tommy and sally forth ourselves to explore Hongkyu and see the excitement going on there. The Japanese sailors have indeed made it look warlike in Hongkyu. Barricades everywhere. It's not a healthy place for Chinese stragglers. Frisking anybody who looks as if he might be on his way to do a little sniping is one way in which the Japanese sailors keep busy and warlike. But these Hongkyu barricades set up to withstand a Chinese offensive need never have been built. For the Chinese respected the international agreements and did not try to enter or fire into the settlement. But it is an anxious time for the Chinese living here with armed Japanese on every hand. A new blaze breaks out in Chapei, set by another air attack, and we hasten over there to see the firemen, busy now, night and day, trying to keep the flames from spreading to the international settlement. Back in Hongkyu, where to be Chinese is to be unhappy, and to be armed is to be arrested as a sniper fit only for a sniper's death. Even when examined and released, the Chinese caught danger for the machine guns of the Japanese mounted on trucks, spray bullets down the fear-infested streets whenever an armed enemy is spotted. The burden on the international settlement becomes unbearable. Many flee still further by the river steamers. 200,000 refugees have poured pell-mell into the area of safety. Homeless and hungry, fear still possesses them that the entire city will become a battlefield. So the boats on every trip to Ningpu are crowded far beyond the limits of safety with bewildered souls, fleeing from death and seeking food and haven free from gunfire and air raids. The United States Marines have the situation well in hand along Suchow Creek, which bisects the settlement. The creek is there, but you can't see it for the sandpan. It is here that one of our cameramen was barely missed by a stray bullet from some sniper. Watch this pile up at the corner. Wandering Chinese, curious as always, sometimes gives the leatherneck some good-natured policing to do. In the French concession, which is wholly under French control, as distinguished from the international settlement, the Poilus are proud of their tanks. If trouble starts here, the French are ready for it. Not so many years ago, the French learned what barbed wire is good for in time of war. And here they are, using it again. 
The Italians complete the international look of things by sending ashore from the battleship Libya an armed force ready to do its share in protecting the settlement. Nowhere but in Shanghai could it happen that so many nations share in turning one city into a huge armed camp. Here's the Japanese flagship, the Izumo, moored in the Wangfu, just in front of the Japanese consulate. Historians will have to state that the Japanese so little expected the stiff resistance they encountered from the Chinese that they undertook the adventure with only sailors, marines, and men from their part of the settlement. From the warships came only a few more than a thousand men. These are fine ships, equal to any of their type in the world, but this soon turns out to be more than a naval job. More men are speedily needed. And so Japan sends her first reinforcement 5,000 crack troops of the regular army. Surely these men will be enough to force the Chinese back. These are the men to rebuke the Chinese for the boycott on Japanese goods and for other affronts. Soon now the Chinese will not only be driven from Chapei, but from the whole area. So think these Shanghai Japanese who so joyfully hail the warriors from their homeland. But they have not reckoned with Sai Tinkai inspired 39-year-old leader of Shanghai's defenders, nor with the stubborn bravery of the men of China's 19th Root Army, who first to Chapei, and then all along the greatest battlefront since the World War, are to withstand the charges of Japan's picked troops and the bombardment from vastly superior artillery and air forces, and to do it with valor and skill and endurance that will win for them the world's admiration. Even the admiration, one would think, of their Japanese foes. These are the men whose fighting qualities are to do more than check the Japanese army. Their example of sacrifice and courage are to go far toward giving new life to the long-threatened ideal of a united China. Chinese are hard at work entrenching along the railroad to Nanjing. This is the vital link in the Chinese communication, for only by this route can they receive reinforcements by rail. And now the two sides in this war, which is not a war, for there has been no declaration, have come to grips. The Japanese regulars are off to the front, speeding to a more difficult job than they know. But it is one thing to dash smoothly and safely to where men are meeting in a death grapple. For many, it is quite another thing, the trip back. Here are Chinese trucks returning from the front bearing desperately wounded men who've lost all interest in boycotts, fears of influence and the like, perhaps in life itself. But soldiers more or less expect wounds. What shall be said of civilians? This woman, for instance, must she and thousands like her be expected to pay the last full price for peace in China? It's a heavy price, a tragic price. Now we'll take you down the river to Wusan, China's Verdun where stirring history was made. On the way, we pass Wusong village, now a mass of wreckage after repeated attacks and counterattacks, the cost of being a village near a fort. Here's the entrance to China's strong Wusong fort, 16 miles from Shanghai, and guarding the mouth of the Wangpu River. The men who manned these guns in the face of fire from Japan's mighty warships, day after day and week after week, when defeat was sure to come in the end, will long be heroes of China. Even now, the Japanese fleet is out there in the Yangtze. For though direct hits have finished most of the Wusong guns, the last remnant of the brave garrison is still manning the few guns that will send back answering shells. No one knows how it is possible, but we find a few men left at Wusong still on the job after the Japanese fired a thousand shells into the fort. You know that daily bulletin? Wu Song still holding out. Well, now you see some of the men who made possible that long drawn out drama of bravery and endurance. Even they are gone now. It took repeated attacks by Japanese naval vessels, aircraft, and land forces to silence the Wu Song fort and remove the defenders. A day or so after these pictures were taken, the job was done at last. On our way back to Shanghai, a glimpse of desolate, ruined Wu Song village. Not a soul to be seen, not a house that isn't ruined. <laughs> well, it's a very mixed sort of war. Even goats get into it. Brought along from India by way of Hong Kong.
by native attendants of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, who managed somehow to be in any war or near war that concerns Great Britain. These Scotch laddies take their campaigning in a light-hearted way, but as they swing down along Nanking Road in Shanghai, one feels that whoever they're going to protect will jolly well be protected. Likewise, Uncle Sam's boys are guarding this station. We know that the factory is going to be fairly safe. Those are United States Blue Jackets and the flags there in evidence. This looks like an American transport. It not only looks like it, it is. Remember how the Showmont steamed under force draft from Manila with a thousand men of the gallant 31st Regiment and 600 Marines? Well, here she is, and every American in trouble Shanghai is going to breathe a good deal easier now. Curious Japanese flyers come to take a peek at the Showmont as she warps into her dock, and then the men of the old 31st who see more trouble in more places than any other regiment in the American army and like it, come ashore. So this is Shanghai. The 31st has a great war record. But let's hope Shanghai won't be real war for these boys. But we know now that they share the tough spots in guarding the international settlement with the British lads. Well, the gang's all here now in goodly numbers. Americans, British, Italians, and French. The soldiers in the settlement form a good-sized army doing a lot of watchful waiting on the sidelines while two Oriental armies have it out in their debate about boycott, insult, and whatever else the ghastly business is all for. As for the French, they are a fell people. The French soldiers say, if a single barricade is good, a double one is better. Let us have barricades a little better than other people's barricades. And if a barricade is nice and high, let us by all means take it and make ours a little nicer and a little higher. But as the French concession is smack up against the old native city, and the French must guard it all by themselves, they can't be blamed for doing a very, very thorough job. The USS Houston, new 10,000-ton cruiser, flagship of Admiral Taylor, lies in the Wangpu River. A further reminder that Uncle Sam is mindful of his people in the troubled area, not to mention such things as treaties and international agreements. On our way back, we notice how the American destroyers that arrived with the Houston flocked together like so many cold animals, huddling in the fading light of the setting sun. Suddenly report that the Japanese may attack Nantao, Chinese section near the French concession, starts the Chinese barricading along the riverfront. Police and civilians, men and boys, undertake this task, which is just so much superfluous exercise. For the Japanese never do launch the threatened attack and probably never intended to. Flights by Japanese attacking planes become a commonplace. But here's what happened to their biggest bomber. It was brought down in flames only 200 yards from the Chinese headquarters the first victim of the 19th Root Army's anti-aircraft artillery. But that was a rare occurrence, a bit of uh, Chinese luck. With machine-like regularity, the Japanese planes returned to their landing field on the shore of the Wangbu, safe and sound after soaring over and back of the Chinese lines, dropping their deadly missiles. It all looked so cozy and orderly here on the flying field. But what was it they achieved? These planes and other Japanese war machines. Here's one answer. Truckloads of Chinese wounded coming in from the front. Then there's the cotton mill inside the international settlement and under control of United States Marines. Bombs dropped here, killed six women and injured 20 a hundred feet away from where the American Marines were on duty. Then a Chinese train loaded with horses and other equipment is hit by Japanese airplane bombs at Chenju, seven miles north of the city, and train and freight demolished. That comes under the head of so-called legitimate warfare, as does the smashing of railway lines. So even the frightful destruction in and around the North Station, terminus of the Shanghai-Nanking Railroad, together with the track itself, 
its locomotives and cars. Most of the buildings in the neighborhood, including the famous commercial press, shops, stores, houses, all of this is the result of Japan's efforts to cripple the railroad and hence cut the main Chinese artery of communication. But what are the millions upon millions in money lost? The thousands dead today who were alive short weeks ago, killed by the engines of war, by the spirit of war, by the terrible workings of the thought that war can settle anything. That is what even those who take no sides in this struggle must be thinking. And what are the civilians, the numberless victims to whom all this air raiding and day and night fighting form one long terror? Homes in ruins, families broken by death and separation. The future full of sinister doubt and despair. Only one thought is clear to them, flight. Day after day, more terrified refugees pour into the settlement until the wonder is, where do they all come from? And yet so strong, even in these days of terror, is the feeling of some of these Chinese for their homes that we find a few still left, combing amid the ruins in a pitiful attempt to salvage what may be left of their belongings. Here, perhaps, rather than in death itself, we see the drinking of the dregs of war. But it goes on. 10,000 more regulars arrive from Japan. The world awaits the outcome, and history will apportion the blame. In the meantime, tragedy stalks at Shanghai. The war machine rumbles. Peace, forbearance, friendliness between two ancient neighboring peoples. These are words ground under the heels of armies. And China, bewildered, old, cumbersome, tries somehow to quell the disaster that threatens at the gate. Just like this aged daughter or that aged lad. The Chinese may die, but China lives on, and on, and on.